Good morning, Destiny. So let's, let's remain standing. Let's read the Word. We want to go to the Word of God immediately. Uh, James chapter 1. James chapter 1. I'm tempted to just read one verse, but let's just read from verse 17 to 25. James 1, 17 to 25. It says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be the kind of first fruits of all he created. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that, that, that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Hallelujah. This morning we'll talk about be, becoming doers of the word. Uh, that you, you can have options. Hearers only or doers and hearers. So you, you cannot just be hearers of the word. The Bible says you must also be doers of the word. And Pastor James, let, let's call him Pastor James, is giving us a pastoral letter. He is supposed to talk to the members of the church in Jerusalem, uh, which he observed. You have just been hearing and hearing and hearing. It's time to act. Hallelujah. So let's pray. Hallelujah. Father in heaven, we want, O oh Lord, to be doing what you are saying. Your word is powerful. Your word is alive and active, sharp, sharper than two-edged sword. It penetrates. It connects. It root, roots inside, Lord. Your word is penetrating our hearts and our soul and our spirit. And we want it to be active, Lord that we will be able to act on it, to follow it, and to obey it. I pray, Father, that you give us the Holy Spirit this morning, Lord, and speak to your people, O Lord. Many things you are commanding us, O Lord, to do. Many things you have promised, Lord, that you are willing to fulfill and you are willing to, to perform before us, O Lord. Many commands, many promises, Lord, and words that are beautiful, O Lord. Bless us, Lord this morning and help us uh, understand how to make it, uh, how to do it, how to perform it in our life, O oh Lord. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The church has been criticized again and again as very willing to listen, but very slow to act. We have been criticized as being hypocrites because at one, at one part, at one side, we claim certain things about what God is telling us to do. We claim that we are Christians, but on the other side, 
there is problem in performing what what God expects us to do. So I don't know if that is rebellion, but I think some of that is because we lack the understanding. When we read the Word of God, when we approach the Word of God, we lack the understanding how to do it. So the, the idea of this message this, uh, this morning is that we must decide and plan how to go beyond simply hearing. And then uh, present to God our life where we are in the area of performing. It is not good for us to be theoreticians on theories about Christianity. We need to be practitioners. We need to practice it. Will you say amen? amen. To be hearers of the word and not doers only. So it's like a bird. A bird has two wings. You know, Christians have two wings. One is hearing. One is doing. Now, you cannot, you cannot claim you're doing Christianity without the Word. Now, that is presumption. We do not do that. We listen first. So, the first part is hearing. We hear the Word of God. We understand what He is saying. And then, we uh, receive power from Him and we act it in our life. Hallelujah. We need to hear the Word of God. We need to, to become good hearers. We have been talking about how, how we can be responsive to God. We need to know how to respond to God. Now, James, in the first two verses that we read, verses 17 to 18, is telling us something about God. Something about God. Look at the verse. Come on, look at the verse. He's telling us something about God and also about the time when God speaks. Because when God speaks, we better listen. Amen. We start there. When God speaks, in verse 17, we will begin to understand that His Word is reliable. Will you say the word reliable? When God speaks, you know what we get from what he is saying? Not only information, but we get that he is so reliable. James said, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He is the God who does not bend. According to one translation says, that God in God there is nothing deceitful. There is nothing deceitful in God. When he says, he, he meant what he says. Hallelujah. He is very truthful. You can trust what he is saying. There is nothing deceitful in God. Nothing two-faced. Nothing fickle. He brought us to life using the true word. Showing us off as the crown of all his creatures. In other words, he is worth hearing. Because he is the father of lights. There is no shifting shadows in him. You know, he, he does not change. He does not bend. No double-faced. He is just true to his word. So that's number one. Number two, when God speaks, we begin to realize that he performs what he says. Verse 18. When God speaks, he creates things. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Look at that word. He chose to bring us up or he chose to give us birth. How many of you have experienced being born again? Raise your hands. This verse refers to your experience of being born again by the word of truth. Hallelujah. His words are true. When he says, you, you repent, I will forgive. Hallelujah. You turn from your sins. And I will forgive and delete all your sins. He says that I will not remember them anymore. Hallelujah. And if you are dead, I'll give you life. 
being born again by the word of truth. The word of truth is what God is capable of, of saying. When he says, it's always true. Hallelujah. Amen. You can always rely on the word of God. When he speaks, he creates a new person inside. He, he creates a new man inside. Hallelujah. Several things about being born again that I want to mention. Number one, in verse 18, it says, By his will, by his choice, he chose to give us birth. How many of you choose to be born into the world physically? You know? Did you decide to be born? No. Your mother and your father love each other and they did something and your mother became pregnant and after nine months out you came. Yeah. <laughs> you have no choice. Hallelujah. But with God, someone made a choice. Hallelujah. It says, God chose you to be born again. You are not a product of accident. Someone planned for you. Come on. Someone designed you. A very generous Father in heaven, the Father of lights, wanted you to be born again. Hallelujah. What a gift. Amen. Except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And he chose to give us birth through the word of truth. Hallelujah. In other words, one translation says that he, sp he spoke the word of truth to bring you into reality. By his word of truth, you become real. Being born again is real. You start to exist by the word of truth. He is true to his word. And then the, the rest part of that verse is very interesting because it says that, that we might be a kind of first fruits to all he created. He created many things. How many of you know that God created many things? But of all his creation, he picked you up and made you the... the the sample at the top of all his creation. You are the first fruits of all his creation. First fruits are harvested uh, crops uh, being displayed, saying, God is so good, look at the sample of my harvests. You are the sample of God's harvest. In other words, he celebrated you. You are like a treasure to be displayed to others. From now on, I, I don't want any one of you feeling ashamed about being born again. Don't be, don't be sorry that you lost your old life. Be happy that God has given you a brand new nature inside. You have become a brand new person in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17, you become a brand new person inside. It's an act of God. So when God speaks, He creates. When God speaks, He is reliable. You can rely on the Word of God. Now, look at the next. The next thing Pastor James spoke about was to prepare the people, reading his, his letter, to prepare them in order for, the, for them to, to hear effectively. What's the use if God speaks and He speaks very, very clear, but you are not prepared to listen? Hello? Hello? God has a design to, to, to help us so that when we listen to God, the listening and hearing Him becomes useful, meaningful, and effective. So He said in verse 19 to 21, I'm just giving you a running commentary. I will summarize it at the end. All right? Verse 19, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. In other words, this is very important. He speaks like a pastor. Take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because, and he explains why he, he mentioned that. Because human anger 
does not produce the righteousness that God desires. He is still talking about the communication atmosphere between God and you and you and God. And God is saying that when I speak to you, be quick to listen. When God begins to sound His voice, and He is beginning to communicate to you, begin to listen quickly. One translation says swiftly. Hallelujah. Be swift to listen and slow to speak. Because sometimes we misinterpret by our words what God is saying. Sometimes we misquote God. And it's not the, it's not the fault of God that we un misunderstand His word. It is our fault because we are not quick to listen. That's why during sermon time or during your devotional time, avoid all other distraction. Amen. And as you listen to this message, don't think about your adobo and your food and your lunch. Forget about them. This is your lunch. Amen. The Word of God. Very good practical advice. Be quick to listen, slow to speak. And that could have been perfect already, but he added, slow to be angry because sometimes we don't like what we hear. How many of you, some, so many times, you read the Word of God, you don't like what you read, or you listen to sermon and you don't like what pastor is preaching. I wish pastor would speak other topic other than that. But that does not happen. Sometimes God speaks His plan, His purpose for you, not to irritate you, but to make you clean. He, wants, he has a plan for you. Amen. You have to have an attitude like, Lord, whatever you say, I will accept it. It's like, it's like when you are small, you don't like the vegetable, but mama says, just eat your vegetable. Amen? It's good for you. Amen? Alogbate, asparagus, whatever. Your mom knows best. Your daddy in heaven knows best. Now, he mentions anger, but also he explains why you need to be slow to anger. Wait a minute, he says. Don't be hostile against what God is saying or against God. I don't think you can grow in spiritual things if you are angry at what God is saying. Look at that verse again. Very, very important. It says, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. You do not become righteous by keeping the spirit of hostility and anger in your heart. You have to yield. You have to surrender to God. Amen? Amen? Now, even if it is human anger in your heart, it creates a man versus God atmosphere. And God is saying, but the, 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 the flow of communication is me versus God. It's like a, a fight. It's like a struggle. It's like a wrestling match. And many times the pastor is preaching and you say, Oh, I don't like that, Lord. Don't, don't, don't say that, pastor. But God is saying, I want to do something right in your life. Amen? Human anger will not fulfill God's desire of making you right. It's logical, very logical, that after you are born again, God will train you to the ways that are right. Because you came into the kingdom and you are born again, but your ways are not right. Hello? You carry with you the baggage of your old life. God says, no, 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 no. I'll teach you what is right. I know what is right and wrong. I will show you righteousness. Amen. Therefore, next verse, get rid of all moral filth, filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in your heart. Here, here are the three things 
that could prepare you could prepare you to uh, to benefit from what God is saying. There are three things. Number one, he says, remove all the wickedness and the filth. Wow. Get rid of filthiness, one translation says. This word is unique. In fact, in the entire Bible, the word translated filthiness is only found here, used by James. It means disgusting filthiness, offensive filthiness. Especially if your background, you know, false religion, idolatry, immorality, uh, fornication, pornography, and all the filthy things that you picked up from the world, get rid of that. It's like clothes. Get rid of your dirty clothes. Will you say amen? One translation says, get rid of those detestable filth. They have plenty of translation for these words because only James is the one using this, ver this word, translated filthiness. So get rid of that. And also wickedness. Again, this is a very unique word. F wickedness, in other translation, it says overflowing, superfluous wickedness. Get rid of evil that is abounding. Here's another translation. Get rid of evil that is to the highest degree. <laughs> is there an evil that goes to the highest degree? That is what, what Pastor James is saying. Get rid of all those evil things because the Word of God can only work in pure heart. The Bible says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Have you ever noticed that when your mind has been infiltrated and conditioned by evil, even if the sermon is very good and the Word of God is very clear, you cannot benefit from it. You have to get rid of all those things. Will you say amen? So purity is the requirement there. So get rid of filthiness, wickedness, and then number three, get rid of pride. Say the word pride because it says you receive the righteousness of God humbly the, the, you receive the imparted word humbly also translated gen, with gentleness hallelujah humility or gentleness my friends my brothers and sisters our approach to God is always, you know, with humility because God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. You open your Bible, you are, you are already projecting that God will speak to you. He is sovereign, He is master, He is boss, He is Lord. And the only way to approach the Word of God is by humility. And when you are humble, you are allowing God. You are, you are like surrendering to God. Okay, God. Uh, embed, implant in me the word of righteousness. Hallelujah. Amen. So those are attitudes that uh, needs to prepare the soil so that the seed will grow. It says, verse 21, it says, therefore get rid of all moral felt and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. I like that. The word planted in you. Um, the word of God many times is compared to a seed. Right? It's a seed. It comes to us as a seed. And when it is coming to us as a seed, it will give us a chance to grow certain crops and fruitfulness in our life. Let me give you some other translation of this verse. Verse 21. You receive the word embedded. It's like, it's like a, you know, a, a computer program where 
something must be done and they embed a, 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 a string of ano panawag si naman? A, a program there so that you can function well. The seed engrafted to you which is your nature. Your nature will be transformed. Here's the word. The, 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 the original word translated engrafted means inborn. It means innate. And it is only used in the entire Bible only in this verse. The word engrafted is used only here. James is very uh, uh, smart in using words that, that emphasizes something in the life of the believers. The word is called seed. When it is implanted in us, the word will create a nature in us. Hallelujah. It is the word of truth inborn and implanted in the soul that one is saved and begotten. You know, I was born again in 1973, but there were there are many characteristic nature in my life, in my habits, in my behavior that needs to be corrected. It's like taming a wild horse. All right? Just pick up from the wild, cannot perform well, but to train that horse, they, they call it, you break the horse. I don't know if they have that in uh, Australia, you break the horse. <laughs> if it's a wild horse, you, you break the horse until the horse begins to surrender. You can put a saddle behind the horse. You can ride the horse. You can let it turn left and you can let it turn right. Every one of us, just like me maybe, you are also wild. You were wild. And the, the, the word of God comes to our heart and begins to discipline us and to train us and to yield. Hallelujah. They say that when, when uh, they have this dog fight, you know, the pit bull and uh, ano mga fighting dogs. Uh, I think uh, Tessa knows more about do these dogs. They, they have dogs and they bet on these dogs and they fight. But before they, they begin to claw at each other and, and, and grab each other, these dogs smell and discern and they understand who is greater than, than him, you know. If this, this is more powerful, he better surrender first. If he is more powerful, he, he can subdue the other, the other dog. But they say that if the other dog, before they, they grab each other, feels that the other dog is more powerful and maybe more uh, aggressive, the other dog will not really fight. He just surrender and, and yield his neck like that. So, he survived by surrendering. I know many Christians who did not survive because they resist the hand of God. They resist the word of God. The only way to survive is to surrender to God. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Christians can come to me and say, Pastor, I have problem. What did you do? I disobeyed the word of God. Most of the problem of people that we talk to are Christians who disobeyed the clear word of God. They should have humbled themselves and surrendered to the Lord. Hallelujah. The Lord wants to save you, teach you what is right, and then put the nature that is godly in you. Hallelujah. I want to have godly nature. I want more godly nature in my mind. I want more godly nature in my emotion. Hallelujah. I want more godly nature in my behavior. The Bible tells us, train yourself to godliness. Godliness is something you can enroll. And you can train yourself into godliness. Amen. How many of you have under training? 
to become godly? Raise your hands. Are you under training? Have you enrolled already? <laughs> we train ourselves to godliness, Paul said. Train yourself to godliness. Hallelujah. So, let me very quickly uh, enumerate our word experience. Here are the word experience. I've mentioned the three. I intentionally did not mention number four because we will, we will conclude our message there with number four. Okay, your first word experience is when you were born again. James mentioned that you were brought into this world with a word of truth. You were born uh, spiritually because of the word of truth. Next, the righteousness of God. In other words, after you were born again, you are you were being trained by the Lord teaching you what is right. It's called the, the right ways of the Lord. In Acts chapter 13, there's a story there about uh, Paul preaching in an island because the governor of the island wants to hear the gospel. But there is there was a sorcerer in the island named Elimas. And Elimas was like an advisor to the governor of the island. And every time Paul would speak, he would oppose and resist and contradict the, the, the words or the teaching of Apostle Paul. And so finally, Paul was like maybe righteous indignation or maybe irritation. He was irritated. He turned to this sorcerer named Elimas and said, why do you always twist the righteous ways of the Lord? Oh, there are righteous ways of the Lord. The righteousness of God is being preached to people. If you are a Christian, God wants you to walk straight. Amen. Of course, Elimas later on became blind. Paul said, because you are doing this, you will be blind. And he suddenly became blind. The, the, the Lord is teaching us the righteous ways of the Lord, the righteousness of God. Until we become... According to Paul, we become the righteousness of God. When people look around and say, where is the righteousness of God? They can look at you and say, that's the righteousness of God. They can see that you are behaving right and walking right, making decisions that are right. You are the righteousness of God, but you are the result of God's word teaching you what is right. Number three is the engrafted word. The engrafted word, the purpose of that is to Bring into you more of the nature and character of God. Character of God is established in us because of His Word or through His Word. Amen? Amen? So, but number four. Let's go to number four. The mirror word. Say the mirror word. Hallelujah. Okay. In James... 123. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets that he what he looks like. You know we have a mirror there. Brother Tony, can you bring the mirror? Because I want people to see their face. Looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Have you ever experienced that? You look at the mirror and then you go away and forget what you look like. Here's a mirror. Uh... Let me call someone. Can you come here, Sam? I want you to look at the mirror. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who is the most handsome of them all? <laughs> okay, this is a mirror, okay? No curvature. This is not concave, no convex. It's genuine, true mirror effect. Reflections. Okay, what do you see? You. Handsome or not? <laughs> Handsome. Hallelujah. Is the mirror telling a lie? No. Uh, uh, do, do. Come on, look. Continue to look. 
Because it says that you continue to look at the mirror. The, the, the word of God is like a mirror. You continue to look at the mirror. In those days, mirrors are rare. But if, you, if they have mirrors, the, the client of that mirror will always be women. Or women would look at the mirror regularly, arrange their things, you know. Now, the mirror will not tell a lie. The mirror will tell you who or how you look like. Amen? And then, uh, when you leave, what do you have in your mind about how you look? Do you forget? No. You remember who you are. You better remember who you are. Amen. Thank you, Tony. Uh, the rest of you, Karon mang ispio ka You try to use the mirror. All right. Just to illustrate to you something here, because many people misunderstand this portion of the scripture. But to me, this is probably, I believe, the most encouraging part of this. Uh, letter of James about looking at the mirror of the Word of God and seeing how God is telling you about you. The Word of God being a mirror is God telling you His version of you. Are you following? And that is why if you see His version of you, you will begin to act according to what He has reflected in the mirror, which is the Word of God. Oh, okay. Some of you have two versions of yourself. And you are struggling as you read the Word of God because you begin to interpret two versions of yourself. The first version of yourself, as you read the Word of God, because of the way you handle the Word of God, the first version of yourself is your version. Let me give you an example of your version. When you look at the mirror of the Word of God, some of you are looking at yourself according to yourself. You are not discovering how you look at, how you appear before the Lord. You are looking at yourself by your own version. You are looking at your old version of yourself. You are looking at your old deformed version of yourself. You are looking at your old ugly personality that you have been in the past. You are looking at your imperfections when you were still without Jesus in your life. You are looking at yourself as the unforgiven sinner, the condemned person because of your sin. You are still the old person when you look at the mirror of the Word of God. And that is why you go home and not encourage or you stop reading the Bible because it, you, you are carried into many, many more convictions of things and condemnation of things. And you are not reading it right. As James is saying, when you look at the mirror of the Word of God, it will show you who you really are from the point of view of God. He's telling you, this is who you really are. So your version is about your old life. I have see, shown this uh, verse and I have heard many responses like, you know, when you look at the Word of God, you will find out that you have sinned this way and you have sinned that way. And then you can go to God and, and ask forgiveness from God. That is not what James is trying to say there. You're already born again. God has given you the righteousness of God, the Word of righteousness. And God is implanting the Word inside you. In other words, you're a Christian. God is working in your life. You are God's project. And when God looks at you, you may still be unfinished, but He calls you different names. He does not call you sinner. You are 
a child of God. Hallelujah. You are not anymore broken. You have been fixed. Hallelujah. You are not anymore sick. You have been healed. Hallelujah. In the eyes of God, you have been restored. God has to talk to Jacob. Jacob was wrestling with, with the angel of the Lord. One day, he was running away from his brother and his parents said, okay, just go away because your brother is going to kill you. And there's the scene in the scripture where Jacob was wrestling with the angel of the Lord. And then the angel of the Lord, of course, was winning. But Jacob does not want to let go. The angel said, okay, let, let, let me go because it's, it's dawning. Morning is coming. And Jacob said, I will not let you go un unless you bless me. I will not let go unless you bless me. So the angel said, okay, listen, it's in the story. When, when Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me, the angel now will start to bless him. And so he said, who are you? What is your name? See, he wanted to bless Jacob. And the way to bless Jacob is to ask him, what is your name? And Jacob said, of course, Jacob. You know the meaning of the word Jacob? Jacob means deceiver. What is your name? Deceiver. What is your name? The word means cheat. Deceiver.
yourself, when you have an inner word, you look at the Bible and see a new version of you. God will speak to you. And a new version of you will come from the mouth of the Lord. That's how you should look at your own life. You're not living on the same person. You're a brand new person inside. Thank you. 
you can begin to act and lead the way, you will see God looking at you. You are not a loser. You are a winner. Hallelujah. You are not a victim. You are a victor. Hallelujah. You are not trampled on. You are being introduced as first fruits of all his creation. He celebrates us. I wish you can open the Bible today and tomorrow the following day and begin to look at the mirror of God's word. You are blessed. God has blessed you. You are not cursed. You have been free from the curse. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are with Jesus Christ. You are justified by grace and through faith. You have been redeemed to his blood. You have so much blessing that you cannot count in all your hands and fingers. You have plenty of blessing. But sometimes we dwell on the negative side of things. And even after we are forgiven, we still think that the Tapala Mountain and the human being. Don't say that about you. You are superhuman already. Hallelujah. And then we need to walk like, like, like who you really are. If you are a soldier, according to the Bible, live like a soldier, think like a soldier. Hallelujah. Amen. If you are a child of God, begin to call him that I am. Father, hallelujah, begin to act like you are a child of God. That is the meaning of being two versions of the word. Amen. Be the first of the word. You are not a goat. You are a sheep. Hallelujah. You are not cursed. You are blessed. So, it says that if you do what the word says, you are not just hearing of the word, you are a doer of the word. The Bible says, you will be blessed. You think that is just one word that at the end of the sentence? No, that is big. You will be blessed. And that you think that you are being cursed. God is limiting you. God is trying to cut you up. No, no. God is a blesser. God is a, is a generous father. Hallelujah. So it is. Being a doer of the word requires number one. Faith. So you are doing it requires faith. It says, receive the engrafted word. That requires faith. Number two, it requires action. The first step, the initial step, and then you have to act uh, the word. Number three, it requires inspiration. Why do I say inspiration? It says, not forgetting who you are. That should be your inspiration. Not forgetting who you are. You look at the mirror and you walk away. Not forgetting who you are. You should have been inspired with everything that God says about you. Amen. It requires, of course, say the word done. Because you have to repeat it. It cannot be a habit if you only do it once. You have to do it again and again and again because second hand to you, you are acting like you are a child of God. Your mind is thinking, I'm a child of God. I will not indulge in sin. I will live for God. And then it requires honesty. Say the word honesty. Because the Bible says, not deceiving yourselves. Twice, James said, not deceiving yourself. You do as you heard, not deceiving yourselves. Be honest with it, no cheating. Amen. Be true to yourself. Be honest. Let's bow our heads. I want you to start praying.